Good evening. I'm Andrea Piero, Director of the Visiting Artist Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Each year, SAC's Visiting Artist Program hosts a variety of presentations by internationally recognized artists, designers, and scholars with the mission to foster a greater understanding and appreciation of contemporary art and culture. Throughout its history, the program has served as a critical resource and inspiration for our community. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome visiting artist Mark Dion. I would like to congratulate Mark on the opening of his first US survey exhibition at the ICA Boston that just opened. And I would also like to thank him for taking the time out of his very busy schedule to be here with us this evening to share his work. This evening's program is presented in partnership with SAC's Conversations in Art and Science Lecture Series. And I would like to thank Tiffany Holmes, Dean of Undergraduate Studies, for her support of the series, and thank faculty members Andrew Yang and Jeremy Bolin for their involvement with this visit. At the end of the lecture, Mark will take a few questions from the audience. Our staff will have microphones circulating, so please raise your hand so we can get a microphone to you. Thank you for joining us tonight to help welcome Mark Dion to SAC. And now I'd like to welcome to the podium Tiffany Holmes, Dean of Undergraduate Studies, to introduce Mark Dion. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Good evening. My name is Tiffany Holmes. I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Studies, and it's my great, great pleasure to welcome you and introduce you to our guest, Mark Dion. This event, as Andrea mentioned, is co-hosted by Conversations on Art and Science and the Visiting Artists Program. Under the leadership of SAIC former president, Walter Massey, the Conversations on Art and Science event series was launched in 2011 as a forum for exploring interdisciplinary and critical perspectives on art, science, design, and technology. Lectures or panel discussions hosted each year bring noted thinkers and makers to campus to discuss their work. These dialogues sustain the diverse conversations on art and science that are ongoing in the work of our faculty and our students at SAIC. I would like to deliver a special thanks to the faculty who have been active in our art and science advisory group, particularly Andy Yang, who is acting as our coordinator this year. Our advisory group has had Mark at the top of our visiting artist request list for the past three years, so it's quite exciting that we are about to hear from him live and in person. Mark Dion is one of the most important artists of our precarious ecological present. His largest exhibition to date just opened on October 4th at the ICA Boston. I first encountered Mark's work in person back in 2005 um, at, the, at Mass MoCA. It was a site-specific commission called Library for the Birds of Massachusetts. This installation featured 12 zebra finches housed in a 17-foot enclosure with a dead maple tree, and it held shelves of ornithology books next to bird feeders. In this piece, the artist literally surrounds the finches with the trappings of human knowledge, and do you know what they did? The birds ignored these tomes of people-generated wisdom and went about their avian business. The finches literally defecated on the books. The message? Birds don't care about the books humans write. Birds are all about being birds. So the artist you're about to hear from this evening is incredibly skilled at setting up these sorts of nonlinear systems that pit human against non-human forms of knowledge. Mark's work provides us with clear evidence that artists can have a powerful voice in communicating the complexities and incongruities of our current planetary predicament. Scientists and journalists have written extensively about climate change and the extreme environments we should expect in the future. But the future is now. This fall alone, we have witnessed five major hurricanes with disastrous consequences. This past week, we absorbed the multiple tragedies wreaked by the wildfires in Northern California. Like the birds of Massachusetts, we humans are perched precariously, surrounded by terabytes of evidence that our world has changed and will evolve for better or for worse, though probably for the worse. And what are we doing? What are you doing? What am I doing? And what is Mark doing to change public opinion on the plight of the planet? Artists matter. Designers matter. Writers matter. 
Back in 1962, a writer named Rachel Carson inspired a grassroots environmental movement with the publication of her book, Silent Spring, that raised questions about the long-term effects of pesticides like DDT. Her work ultimately led to the crea creation of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, an organization that faces the threat of closure today. So for our students in the audience, we want you to get involved however you can. Take a class on weather with our new climate scientist, Mike Atasca. Learn about the Anthropocene in a studio symposium with faculty Andy Yang and Jeremy Bolin. Try out scientific illustration at the Field Museum with Peggy McNamara. Enroll in taxidermy and contemporary art with Giovanni Alloy, or matter deconstructed with physicist Catherine Schaefer. Take anything with Claire Pentecost, Lindsay French, Marlena Novak, and Oliver Sand. Please check out the Artist and Science Areas of Study page for next spring's course listings because if you feel some synergy with this lecture tonight, please get involved. Now back to Mark, it's almost time. Mark Dion was born in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He received a BFA and an honorary doctorate from the University of Hartford. Dion has shown globally with major exhibitions at the Miami Art Museum, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the Tate Gallery in London. Mark has produced many permanent large-scale projects commissioned for Documenta 13 in Kassel, Germany, and the Montevideo Biennale in Uruguay, among others. Dion has reserved, received numerous awards, including the ninth annual Larry Aldrich Foundation Award, the Joan Mitchell Foundation Award, and the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Lucida Art Award. Dion is the co-director of Mildred's Lane, an innovative visual art education and residency program in Beach Lake, Pennsylvania. I want to close my introduction tonight by naming for you a short list of the collections of objects that over the last 20 years have been transformed into art through Mark's expansive research-based practice. Nurse log, pesticide sprayer, found alligators, fallen hemlock, manatee skeleton, tar-covered rat, poultry shears, artificial giant mouse, lamp finials, duck decoy, gas tank, Barnacle Encrusted Spoon. Please join me in welcoming Mark Dion to the podium. Thank you. That was truly one of the best introductions I've ever received. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's great to be amongst so many friends here. The images that you saw while Tiffany was speaking are from uh, Mildred's Lane, and that is this uh, residency that I co-founded with uh, the artist, uh, former fashion designer, and graduate from this fine institution, J. Morgan Pewitt. And so remind me to talk about that at the end during the questions. I'm not gonna talk about jellyfish, although I could, but I do love this image. I am, you know, in, in starting this talk, it's going to be a little bit like a whirlwind. I'm going to take you on a tour of the world. It's a little bit like sitting in your uncle Milton's basement and looking at his vacation slides, but I'll try to be more entertaining. So we're going to start in Venice, right, the city of, of um, great art commerce, commerce, the city of great uh, history. And, and, a, and part of that history, of course, is the artists who, who spent time in Venice. And, I'm interested in looking at that history. One of the things we don't think about in terms of the Renaissance is that, you know, um, in the Renaissance you had a model called the Studiolo. The Studiolo is the place where artists, the artist does his or her research, right? And that's a place um, that's very different from the workshop, where the work is made. We often think about research as a new thing in art, and that nothing could be further from the case, right? So. The artist has the studio. It's the place where they are doing their correspondence. It's a place where maybe they are hosting their patrons. It's a place where they're doing their preliminary drawings and research. And so I've made in this Casa de Tre Occhi my kind of low budget version of that, right? And here one can walk in and see that the artist is 
obsessed and interested in looking at the tradition of the Wunderkammer, you know, these 16th and 17th century collections that are not guided by our principles, our scientific principles, or the principles that arise in the Enlightenment. These are pre-Enlightenment collections. They are shockingly numerous uh, in Europe at the time, uh, uh, spreading from, um, you know, the southern Italy all the way to Aarhus and, and northern Europe. Uh, they are very much a response to Europe's uh, mind being blown by realizing that the world is far more expansive than they ever dreamt of and that there are uh, cultures and peoples and architecture and organisms that they never saw, of course, and that uh, this is uh, very much at the beginning of a a large and vicious colonial endeavor, but these things begin to trickle back and also things begin to be found and understood in a different way in Europe, things like fossils, things like archeology. span So these things are amassing this material, amassing archeological objects before there is a field of archeology, span amassing fossils before people understand what they are, right? So my artist in the, in the Stuliolo is looking at these images and imagining uh, a chain reaction of objects that starts 400 years ago. Imagine, say, a Dutch sailor is uh, in what we would now call the Philippines. Um, he's probably part of some horrific colonial endeavor, but he finds a, uh, a sea snail. So he kills the snail, prepares the shell, sticks that into his duffel bag, sails back across the world, and in Harlem or Amsterdam, that shell is taken to a, um, a curiosity dealer who sells that on to a curiosity collector who puts that in his cosmological cabinet where it's drawn by an artist, turned into an engraving, bound into a book, and that is the end of this chain for 400 years. So I was interested in Let's, can we build another link onto that chain? Can we take these images and remake them back into objects? And I'm interested in this period of time because I see the modern age as bookended by what is sometimes called this age of the marvelous, the Europeans' enthusiasm at, uh, at um, the, the, and wonder at these things that are uh, from the new worlds. And so that's one bookend. And another bookend is our moment, where we can really consider ourselves mourning the loss of these things. And that very process that Europeans began, whether that's colonialism or industrial agriculture or capitalism or any of these things, is exactly that modern era and is that those bookends. Mourning and loss now, wonder then, right? So I wanna build a link back to that. So I create in this space, this studio, where viewers can come through and they come through and see my team and I, as you see, we're all very happy here as makers because we actually do love to make stuff. And we are taking all of those objects that you saw in those drawings and remaking them. So again, it's a little bit like a game of telephone as well. Once there was an organism that was part of an ecology that became part of that became divorced from the organism, all of it became divorced from the ecology, and then it becomes part of a collection, it tells a story, and then it becomes a drawing, and then it becomes an engraving. At each time we're getting further and further away, and now we're gonna get even further away because we're gonna make that into a sculpture. So here's my friend, uh, the artist Christy Gast, uh, Pandora Gastelum, this amazing artist who used to work for Jim Henson, who is just like the kind of person who can kind of make anything. So as you notice, all of those images have crocodiles hanging from the ceiling. Uh, we need a crocodile. Um, Pandora is the person to do a crocodile. And Clara Hobsa, another artist who I worked with at Columbia when she was a grad student and I continue to work with in friendship and collaboration, my wife Dana Sherwood. So we are going through this and visitors come and see the process. For me, process is, I'm very greedy about the idea of process in my work. I've never seen a painting that was better in the museum than it was in the artist studio, right? But I know not everyone gets the experience of seeing the artist studio. Not everyone gets to see decisions not made and material choices and how it happens. So I often try to interject that into these works to give people, even if it's a thea in a theatrical sense, what that experience of making is. And so here is our space where we um, 
We do all the heavy lifting, the grinding, the sanding, the dirty work. This, la this almost last room is the, um, what would be like the varnishing room in the Renaissance studio. It's, the work is nearly done. Here is Sarah Mercer putting on the final coats. And then finally, you get to our cosmological cabinet itself. You get to see the objects that are completed. But you don't start with the cabinet full because we're still making things. So you start with lots of holes. You know, I'm very much a child of the 70s. I can't get over my fascination with things that glow in the dark, right? So, but I also want to talk about the spectral nat uh, nature of these things, that these specimens are all ghosts, in a sense. They're, they are kind of ghosts of the modern era, right? And you see within this the kind of strange heterogeneity that exists within the Wunderkammer as well. This kind of mixing of the natural and the artificial that seems so incredibly challenging for our modern sensibility, that you would put the natural and the artificial not only together side by side, but sometimes even in the same object, right? And so as the exhibition goes on, visitors can see this space getting more and more full, and also full not only with things, I mean, here you see the great auk in the center, an organism that is now extinct, has been extinct for quite a while. Uh, you see uh, objects, um, ethnographic objects unbound from their cultures. You see fakes and forgeries and humbugs, which already existed in the 19th century. Already people were putting uh, organisms together in a way to trick buyers. And then here, finally, you see the fi uh, one of the final cabinets with, with historic um, uh, things like the, the Hydra of Hamburg, with weaponry, with, of course, a fantastic crocodile, with even a jackalope, which existed long before the jackalope here in North America were discovered. All right, now we're going to go across Europe to uh, Norway. This is the Arlen Mountain. Uh, in Norway. The Arlen Mountain uh, is a couple hours outside of Bergen. It's, it's sort of almost be right between Oslo and Bergen. Uh, the Arlen Mountain is never warm. This is like the Arlen Mountain on the hottest day in August, right? It is above the tree line. It's just this wonderful place. So I was invited to come here uh, and, and look at this as a site by the Department of Transportation. It's hard for me to imagine the American Department of Transportation inviting artists like um, Louise Bourgeois and, and uh, Fishley and Weiss and I to come and make a work. So, and this happens because Norway is this oil um, rich country and that the wealth of that oil has been nationalized. So the people of Norway have gotten out of this new opera houses and new ports and new roads and new airports and new hospitals and new s universities, right? Th so that's where that money went instead of into the hand, into the pockets of a few um, um, stakeholders. So, uh, so they thought, well, okay, so they have this problem because between, Norway, between Bergen and Oslo, these roads go over mountains. And even with the kind of massive um, snow removal equipment you have there, they can't keep the road open all year. So they use this money to build tunnels. There's one tunnel that's 24 kilometers long, and this is at the end of that tunnel. And so... And, uh, and that's fantastic. They really improve the road system. They can, it's open all year round. So, but what do we do with the old roads, they ask? They go through spectacular landscapes. You know, they, they ride along the edge of, of gorges and, and, uh, and you can, um, uh, they, they pass by beautiful glacial ponds and enormous stretches of tundra and mountains. So they said, well, this is so beautiful. Uh, you know, we can see the fjord so well. Let's create the tourist road. And so the tourist road is a place where people from all over the world can come and ride coaches and go across this beautiful landscape. I said, that's great, but that's not enough. Let's hire the most uh, exciting, challenging, forward-thinking new architects to build architecture on these roads, to build rest stops and scenic overlooks. And so they do this for a decade. They invite young architectural firms to do challenging, exciting, cool architecture. Again, the Department of Transportation, right? And so after they do that for a decade, and it's very successful, lots of architectural awards are won, they say, okay, now let's, now let's put in some art. So they commission a, a, one of the last large pieces from Louise Bourgeois, Fishley Weiss, and I to do art, and they bring me here to the Arlen Mountain. 
And I look at this and I say, are you crazy? You want to fuck up this landscape with a work of art? You know, what could be worse? So I have to think, okay, how can we make something here that speaks to this space and at the same time helps to understand it and read it because it seems like this incredibly intact environment, but it's not entirely. So I made a work that is essentially in the underworld. You know, in, Nor in Nordic mythology, there's a lot of traffic between our world and the underworld. So I really wanted to make a nod to that. And also, of course, in uh, Nordic archaeology, uh, people are buried in these caverns. So I made this entrance to the underworld, which just happens to be exactly my size, which most Norwegian men are not. So there's always a bit of revenge built into these works somehow. And so. So you pass 30 feet or so in, in darkness in this tunnel, and then you end up in a room, and you're in this chamber looking across at what seems to be a, a diorama. Well, it is a diorama. It's a diorama which shows a cave, this cave with stalactites and stalagmites, this kind of uh, interior cavern. It looks a little bit more like the kind of cavern you might see from the first seasons of Star Trek than a natural cavern, but there, there's some theatricality. And in that cavern is a giant collection of material culture, starting at the bottom with things from the Paleolithic and Neolithic age, going to uh, the beginnings of, of agriculture and settlement, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, uh, the Viking culture, the um, influence of, of um, South European classical culture on the rest of the world, the uh, start of the um, of settled agriculture, the Industrial Revolution, right through to today. Here we see an object. This is the slide carousel, something I'm really sorry. It's a technology I'm sorry where we've lost. Uh, and then, of course, right up to um, cell phones and chargers. And atop that, in case you missed it, is a massive bear. And this bear is kind of sleeping on this um, collection of material culture in some way. She is a sort of representative of the of wilderness in a sense. This is the there are as I said these landscapes in these mountains have everything intact except the two things that we cannot seem to cohabitate with right bears and wolves the two things that we feel are directly in competition with us the two other apex predators but she is merely waiting for this phenomena that we call civilization to wear off in the same way that. Uh, this, this kind of momentary glitch in geo, ge, geological history that we call civilization to pass so nature can again emerge and take back the landscape. All right, we're going way back now to Venice again. We're returning to Venice, the city of great romance, the city of great art history, the city of... Um, of canals, this city of incredibly disgusting mud, right? And that mud is at the bottom of these canals. If you've ever been to Venice at low tide, you know a little bit what I'm talking about. Also in Venice, it's quite expensive to get things to your home and out of your home because everything must move by water, right? So if you have your big screen TV delivered to watch the Super Bowl, that has to come by barge, right? And if your washing machine breaks, it has to leave by barge, unless of course, in the middle of the night, it should get too close to the edge, and there's a gentle plop, and you, have, and you have saved yourself an enormous expense. So these things gather in the bottom of the canals and cause traffic, uh, problems for the, for the boat traffic. So the city has a navy of barges that go around and dredge these things out and dredge the mud. Of course, the mud is moving like the water, just in a much slower way, and does clog and cause problems. So these barges reach down, grab the, into the bottom, and pull up this incredibly richly disgusting dredge material, this mud. They put it into the center of their ship, they sail it out to the canal, and they dump it over and over and over again. So I wanted to know, what is in that? Like, what's in that? So um, I was the guest of the Nordic Pavilion, because I am truly the Nordic ideal. Uh, in, um, uh, and I took the contents of one of these barges and put it outside the beautiful modernist um, pavilion, and you know, which is challenging, as I said. This stuff is 
anaerobic. It's incredibly smelly. It has a strange ecology of, of uh, mole, uh, mole shrimp and worms and cyanobacteria, and it smells very like rotten eggs. But it also is so incredibly archaeologically rich that you couldn't stick a pencil into this without hitting something. So what is that something is what I wanted to know. And I spent my summer cleaning the sample, removing all of the human-made things from this matrix of mud. And um, as I mentioned, I'm very interested in the tradition of the Wonder Camera. So I turned their former storeroom into my Wonder Camera. But it's, it's a little bit more like, you know, there's two traditions in Europe. You have the, the tradition of the Wonder Camera from the Renaissance, which really, where people really understand that their treasure does them double duty if they show it. You know, it's like the, the era of bling begins then. And then you have, before that, you have the treasure trove, where you hide away your treasure in the, in the darkest dungeon or the highest tower. That's the sort of medieval tradition. You, you kind of keep it all hidden and protected. So this is something in between, right? And of course, unlike the treasure trove, I don't have um, I don't have emeralds, I have broken green bottles, and I don't have precious metals, I have oxidized iron, and I don't have um, pearls, I have broken bits of shell. You know, I don't have a crocodile to hang from the ceiling, but I have these other cool things from my sample. Um, and of course, you know, if it makes no sense for me to organize these things in the way that an archaeological museum does, right? They do a pretty fair job. So I'm not telling you the narratives that they might have, right? I'm not telling you about, um, you know, the development of styles and technologies through uh, the introduction of other cultures. I'm not telling you about uh, minute differences between objects. I'm putting things together in a much more, um, it's sort of a artificially superficial way, you know, and it's a kind of, um, uh, it's a little bit like the Martian um, archaeologist who comes here and doesn't really know what these things are for, you know, so they're placed together based on superficial resemblances, right? Based on a kind of dialogue between materiality that is intentionally uninformed. So that gives a lot of room for the viewer, but also because I can't help myself, I'm a person who is designed to frustrate your expectations about what exhibits are and what museums are. So I might play with museum conventions. Like here you see that, you know, everything is all of these samples, which, which, you know, Venice is not an ancient city by Italian standards. You know, there's no Etruscan Venice. There's no, there's no Roman Venice, right? It's a young city. So you'll see, but, you know, we find lots of samples from the Renaissance. So you'll see everything is carefully numbered. But if you try to find the reference for that number, you'll go mad because there is no reference, right? So, so I want to build up these expectations of you know what an exhibition is, you know how it works, but I'm not giving you all the parts, right? So it must be something different. And then, of course, you enter the last part. So you have one stage that is the dig site, the material. One stage is the presentation. And then the last stage is actually the preparation, the lab. And I'm always, you know, I'm always condensing the laboratory and the studio as one thing, right? So you see things still embedded in mud. You see things that are being cleaned. You see things that are beginning to take the form, some form of organization. Uh, you see roads not taken. Again, I want process to be visible, but I also want to challenge the taxonomies that I present you in the other room because there are other ways it could be done, right? I, I don't want this to seem uh, inevitable, natural, scientific, objective, right? I want you to know, this was the worst summer of my life, right? <laughs> uh, you know, I needed a hepatitis shot, I needed tetanus shots, I, this stuff is incredibly smelly, it's very oily, it has lots of um, waste elements in it, and the, the the Venice Biennial is insane, right? It's very crowded. Every time you do something, there's a camera crew in your face and dozens of people. So I thought, well, this is great, uh, but I'm retiring from the world of archaeology. No more archaeological projects. So for my next archaeological project, I worked in London. <laughs> and London is a much more ancient city than Venice, right? And, and uh, London is really in its place because of the Thames River. The Thames River is an extremely strong 
tidal river, right? Um, so twice a day, the tide goes out, and this area that you can see here called the foreshore is visible. And every time the tide goes in and out, uh, it's like a new roll of the dice. The, the, the foreshore is scoured, and you find new things. The foreshore is insanely archaeologically rich. At no point can you look down and not see something, right? So I wanted to also know what that something was. And uh, this was done at a moment where there were suddenly two Tates, right? There, was, there had always been the Tate Gallery, and then now there was going to be the Tate Modern, or what we call them now, the Tate Britain and the Tate Modern. So I wanted to do something about these two sites. So I did two archaeological digs, one week at each site, uh, and, uh, and my, I worked with a team who were either over 65 or under 17, so teenagers and what are called pensioners there, right? So these group that don't often work side by side, but that worked in a very interesting, as an interesting metaphor for the whole project. Each day, we did one dig at Bankside, where the Tate um, Gallery is, and one dig at Millbank, or, no, Bankside, where Tate um, Modern is, and one dig at Millbank, where, where the Tate Gallery is. One week, each site, about five hours a day, 14 to 17 people, you can gather a lot of stuff, right? And um, so this is my team here. This is actually a coven of witches because this is the summer solstice, and so they were doing a they were doing a midday baptism. And I'm I'm absolutely certain that there was a, a another group of witches who were coming much later to do a different kind of baptism. But that we found a, there's an enormous amount of magical traffic on the Thames even still today. We found tons of, of magical objects. Uh, so anyway, so my group of, of uh, people, would, we would work and we were instructed to collect every human-made thing within the area that we designated. So any bit of culture, I had two amazing project managers, people who I, I've worked with before, uh, people who, who have amazing, um, um, had amazing futures, Naomi Beckwith, who's here in Chicago, and Lenka Clayton, who's in Pittsburgh, both extremely successful in their fields. Somehow, I pulled the lucky straw on this one and got these two people to really help me on this project. There were other the volunteers like uh, Hamsini and Alexis, two, uh, two girls who had the most acute vision of anyone I've ever met in terms of finding things, right? You always have this idea of the, um, you know, in, in archaeology, you have the idea of the search image. It's the kind of idea you keep in the back of your head that helps you find something, helps you find a, a flint flake or, or a pottery sherd. These girls were, had their search image was so refined, they were finding pins and needles from the, you know, the London Bridge that partially tumbled into the Thames was the headquarters of the nail wire pin needle trade, and they were finding, you know, 150-year-old brass pins. So just incredible, incredible team to work with. This is my group of pirates on any particular day. So that's the dig. One week at each site, collecting everything we get our hands on, bringing it now to, um, to the lawn of the Tate. This is, uh, this is very much... If you can imagine how busy the front steps are here, or the front steps of the Metropolitan in the summer, that's what it's like here. So it's incredibly busy. So we build these Indiana Jones style tents. We're kind of colonizing the colonizer in a way. And we have these tents that have all of the finds. And, we, and you know, we found tens of thousands of things. So for the rest of the summer, we process that material. That means every single a bit of broken glass, every ceramic piece, every iron bit comes out of the tents, is cleaned, is cataloged, and then classified. And so we had this, this line, this police line, which would kind of supposedly keep people out, but our rule was that anyone could come under the line unless, you're, unless someone was an obvious lunatic, right? And so people came, and they came back, and they wanted to engage with us. And by the end, we had lots of people bringing us things. And everyone treated us a little bit like the Antiques Roadshow, right? They wanted to know, like, what's the most expensive thing we found? What's the oldest thing we found? You know? But um, people like this wonderful dandy could come and peruse the tents. And, and it was very, very open. And also, we did courses every single day. 
from cultural historians, art historians, people who had a practical relationship with the Thames, like the Thames police force and the harbor master, would come and talk to us about what the Thames is, what it means. Uh, and, you know, this, this was hard work, right, for, for um, the young people I worked with. You know, this is essentially a summer of cleaning broken dishes, you know. This is a small sample of the bones from Bankside. You know, Bankside is the part of the city of London where all the things that were not acceptable to the proper city of London were done. So that's where the slaughterhouses were and the vinegar factories and the binge drinking and the theater and the whoring, all of that went on in uh, Bankside. And, the, and there's very much kind of evidence of that uh, in, the, in what we acquire, like these um, bones from the slaughterhouses. And everything gets, as I said, everything gets cleaned, processed, so you start off with all glass. And then it's like, oh, right, green glass and brown glass and clear glass and purple glass, then bottlenecks, bottle bottoms, bottoms that, bottles that have writing on them. So refining and refining and refining until we run out the clock. Then a vast double-sided cabinet is made based on the original cabinets at the British Museum, but this side, of course, it has one side bank side, one side mill bank, and this contains 90% or 99%, I should say, of the things that we found inside the river. And of course, it's double-sided, so it implies a comparison. So isn't that the point of something like this? You would be able to compare the two material cultures, but you can't because I don't show you the same things on the same side. I don't use the same exhibition strategies. So again, I'm trying to frustrate those expectations of what you might think you're going to learn from something like this, because maybe you're going to learn something else. And of course, it's full. It's full of richness, and it's also full of things. I mean, I can't show you every cell phone we found, and every battery we found, and every bullet from the Second World War, and every, uh, and every ship in a bo um, message in a bottle, and every human tooth, and every uh, watch. So I'm also showing you that there are ways, there are other ways and other things that could be displayed. And like the earliest cabinets, the 19th century cabinets of the Enlightenment, these are, there are drawers that are, are meant to be pulled out, right, and examined. And so when you start to examine them, you think, oh, now I understand how the methodology, things are gonna be organized by size. But then you pull out the next drawer and things are organized by color. And you pull out the next drawer and they're organized by utility. So you can't find the system because what the system is is an encyclopedia of systems, right? It's an encyclopedia of how one might put things together. And of course, what's vitally important is that unlike an archaeological endeavor where people are interested in specific moments in time, this is interested in all moments in time. So it frames history as a continuity that we are undoubtedly a part of, right? So it's not history is something that happened to someone else a long time ago. History is this kind of thing that's flowing and including us. This is my greatest hits drawer where we see like bits of a medieval lice comb and 16th century ceramics and a contemporary voodoo doll and bullets from the Second World War and teeth from the bears from the bear baiting pits and Bellamy ceramics and a Renaissance child's shoe, you know, these kinds of things. And the last element are the photographs of everyone who participated. You know, we, I always, we always call them volunteers, but I don't know why we call them volunteers because everyone's always paid. So, uh, but it shows everybody, not just um, the, the pensioners and the kids, but also people like the tape publicity guy and the video person and the project manager. And I think this is always interesting for me, like, you know, in the cinema, you have this, you know, you have the thing at the end of the movie, the credits, that where everyone who works on a big project gets acknowledged, whether you were like the, a hair and makeup person or a lighting person or the best boy, whatever that is, uh, you know, or drove a car, your name is there. And we have these complicated projects in art, but we don't have a protocol for how to acknowledge that this is not the, this is not authored by one person. So I'm always trying to find a solution for that. And this is maybe one of the more elegant ones. All right, so now, now I want to talk about um, art in public places. And I'm sure you all know that, um, that plop art, or a certain kind of public art, 
uh, is certainly the category of art where the greatest crimes against um, humanity, aesthetics, art, culture are created, right? And so um, I see Mary Jane nodding because she's had this war on plop art since I've known her. So I, you know, I'm always thinking, what's an interesting model for things that you could put in the public space? And, and one of the models I look at is the idea of the folly, right? Follies are these architectural structures that were built in the 18th and 19th century, not to have a practical purpose, like a, like a barn or chicken coop, but, uh, but to, to be discursive, to, to make meaning, right? To, to be buildings that create a situation. So I think that that's something that we could maybe wrestle from the aristocracy and make our own kind of follies, make things that are architecture, sculpture, and in my case, installation, that I don't have to give up the complexity of being an installation artist just because I'm working outside. And sometimes people can even be invited into them. So, but they are like follies, they're place-based. So I have to always tell you a little bit about the place. So this is at the Tijuana Slough um, Wildlife Sanctuary, or it's a nature preserve on the border of the United States and Mexico at San Diego and Tijuana. So one of the more radical borders uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And it's a place that is saved as, an, as a nature reserve because it was once a garbage dump. It was once um, where the Navy tested its bombardments and it's on the border. So also it is a, a contested zone, right? So it's, it's attached to sprawling California suburbs. So there's always kids wanting to ride their BMX bikes and there's always park rangers trying to stop them. It's on the border, so there's people sn sneaking across the border. There are people stopping people sneaking across the border. Um, there, it is adjacent to the, um, where the Navy trains its helicopter pilots, so you could never really be in this spot without one to four helicopters overhead. And um, so it's not the most restful area for a nature preserve you've ever heard of. But if you are a fish who needs to swim up river, this is where the Tijuana River enters the Pacific. This is your best shot. If you're a bird that needs to lay your eggs on a beach, this is your best shot on many miles on both sides of the border. If you're a garbage eating skunk, possum, or raccoon, this is probably where you sleep it off in the day, right? So all of these animals are shoehorned. And of course, if you're a migrating bird, you probably stop over into this landscape of mischief, right? You've got surveillance from the um, from the border police, you've got this history with the military. So I wanted to take that vernacular of mischief and make a building that looks like maybe, what is this, Where? what is this? It, it's camouflaged, it's on a beautiful bomb crater, which is often, which is filled with water and therefore also filled with birds. And so how you see this is you give the park ranger your ID and she gives you a key and then you hike out, it's about a mile and a half, two miles, so none of my friends from New York ever saw this. And then you open the, the space, and it opens a little like a transformer, and then instead of, a land, instead of mischief, what you find is a mecca for birders, for people who watch, bir people who love birds. So this has all the kinds of things birders like. It has maps and charts and lists and books and recording devices and, uh, and even you can even do watercolors there. Of course it has optics and you can spend time looking at this um, bomb crater and looking at the surrounding landscape which is absolutely filled with avian life. Uh, there are, you know, there's a hall of fame for, of people who've done a lot for birds. People like Rachel Carson, who was mentioned earlier, Marjorie Stoneham Douglas, Roger Torrey Peterson. There are these photos that look like maybe they're related to Elliot Porter's great triumph of nature photography, but they're actually dead birds in natural history museums, but it doesn't matter. Um, there is a chart in case you want to build a bird. There's, uh, there are x-rays of birds who have run into problems with, um, with cars and guns in the park. So, you know, it is this kind of unexpected place for people to hang out. And this piece was there entirely unpoliced for four months and not a single thing went missing. Nothing. Not, nothing stolen, nothing broken, treated remarkably respectfully. So, as I said, my friends from New York couldn't see that, so I had to make them one. So, this is the Urban Wildlife Observation Unit, which is in uh, Madison Square Park. And this has probably the bio, Madison Square Park probably has the biodiversity of the roof of the building here. So, uh, it's an odd place in a way, but um, 
And I manned it with a very intelligent, very charming uh, DJ who was probably the most ignorant person of the natural world I'd ever encountered. So he couldn't really tell you very much about the wildlife you might observe, but his job was to encourage you in where you might actually find out something on your own. And of course, there were also things like optics and recordings and, uh, and lots of material that one could use. I even had a diorama because it's New York, you know, and you know, New York has dioramas at the Natural History Museum like here. So this diorama with, with roaches and squirrels and rats and pigeons and things like that. So you should come in and if that's not enough, if I can't, if you can't learn anything there, you can at least take away the field guide to the wildlife of Madison Square Park, which we gave away 5,000 of. And, uh, and this has entries for things like grass and, and squirrels and dogs and cats and pigeons and the things you might actually encounter, many of all of which actually have absolutely fascinating natural histories. So, and it also gives, has a timeline of the building. And so this is the first of a series of, uh, of field guides designed by our very own George Colombo right here. Yeah. Many people have ripped off this design since then. Okay, so I, you know, I think about my, my job is, is a little bit about going somewhere and trying to find this thread, right? Like what is it about this place that is interesting, that is unique, that is, that is powerful, that maybe is even so obvious that locals have forgotten that there's something special about their place. So I have to do always this, the kind of the site visit, right? So I went to, this is in the city of Essen in Germany. It's, Essen was the ca cultural capital of Europe outside of the city. Um, and there's a, a large surrounding interesting areas. And Essen has a lot of problems with hydrology because they, they used to be a coal mining place and all of the water, there's just a lot of hydrological problems. So I wanted, I wanted to work with the land and the sea met, which is always an interesting place for me, these edge habitats. and. Um, and so I went to um, a marina in the bitterest cold February. You know, the wind is just blowing across this place at, at you know, 8.30 in the morning. And out there on the frozen ice, there's some birds out there. And I'm looking at this barren landscape with my guide and we're walking around and we're practically hypothermic, right? And so, there, and there's a building with smoke coming out of it, like a little construction shed. And I think, what's this? And he goes, I, th I think we could g g get coffee here. And so we open the door and out billows cigarette smoke and roaring laughter. And we go in, the walls of this place are like caramel colored from years of smoke, right? The bar, there's a bar there with like pinup girl pictures behind the bar. And there are these tables with these big men, like giant men with big hands. And they're all slapping each other on the back and drinking schnapps and beer. And this is like the middle of nowhere. I'm like, so what is this place? And I said, oh, this is the fishing club. And I said, the fishing club? Like, when does fishing season open? And they said, oh, usually around mid-April. So I'm thinking, like, these guys come here every day because of their relationship with an animal, and they have this great time. I want to do something like that, but not for machos, for dandies. <laughs> and so I start looking around, like, where could I do this? And I find this oxygen tank, and I have it moved onto the site, and I work with the... Uh, apprentices at the sewer treatment plant, because uh, this used to pump oxygen into the sewer treatment plant, and they build me this wonderful turret, they build me a nice hobbit door, uh, and we open up the windows, and we create the Amateur Ornithologist Club. And so the Amateur Ornithologist Club is a place where people can come to uh, learn how to um, experience birding and take pleasure in the culture of birds. And of course, there's a library there, there are optics you can take out, there are even um, bird-themed dishes and cups that you can eat off of, there's a library of bird images, um, and you're encouraged to spend time there. Are, are, there's a freeze of people who have done a lot for birds or a lot for our thinking about birds. Uh, and there's an attendant there, and she will introduce you into the fine art of birding and what to look for and how to make watercolors and recordings. And of course, you'll keep track of all the birds that are seen there. Um, it is still a club, right? And clubs are all about drinking and smoking. So you can do that, but you can only drink Grey Goose, Wild Turkey, <laughs> Famous Grouse, Cockspur, uh, 
Parrot Bay rum, and of course you can only smoke larks, of course. <laughs> and it's Germany, so there's just like great kitsch, and it's, it's all about this kind of actual birds, but also our culture of birds, and our way of thinking about birds, and our, and our hopes and projections, and our sensibility that we put onto birds, and everything in the space is bird-oriented. Another place where I'm looking for a thread is the city of Folkestone, and Folkestone is a, a city uh, is a, a city uh, on the coast in England. It's on the Channel. On a good day, you can clearly see um, France. It's next to the White Cliffs of Dover. Folkestone was once a very wealthy seaside town before the British um, discovered Ibiza. They would go to places like Folkestone, and there are grand hotels where the Prince of Wales would bring his mistress, and the and people like H. G. Wells and Bernard Shaw had homes there, summer homes, and of course since then the fishing has given out due to very bad fishing practices. Um, the um, you know again people now travel to go on vacation, no one goes to British beaches. So they wanted to do an exhibition to bring people back to Folkestone to show what amazing bones this city has, what great buildings, what great culture. And so I was very happy to be part of that. And I went to Folkestone looking for, what is it about this place that is different? I come from a faded seaside town. I come from a seaside town that has overfished its uh, stocks. Um, and what I found was everywhere I went, people talked about gulls, seagulls, and they hated them. They were vehemently against gulls. They were, it was like an uproar. People were so upset about gulls because some people love gulls too much, right? And they feed gulls, and gulls are very intelligent. They begin to associate people with food. There's a gull in Folkestone who understands how the Tesco door works and can walk into the supermarket and grab a bag of chips and walk out and open them and all the gulls eat them. So she understands the door. She doesn't understand capitalism. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, they, they know when it's fish and chip day and everyone comes out of the fish and chip shop and they knock the fish, the, you know, they come around the corner at 60 miles an hour knocking the french fries out of your hand and they, it seems like they're laughing at you, but they're not. So, you know, and we know a lot about gulls. We know a lot about gull thinking. Gulls have been studied by ethologists extremely thoroughly for a long time. Um, so what gulls have is a PR problem, right? And so what gulls need is a mobile gull appreciation unit, right? So the mobile gull appreciation unit travels the city of Folkestone, and my gull enthusiast with a kind of evangelical energy try to convince people that to know gulls is to love gulls, that gulls are fascinating, intelligent uh, animals. They're not rats with wings, uh, and also that because gulls are studied so well, it's not possible for us to teach you gull, but we can teach you a lot about what gulls are saying to each other. Like there's a lot we know about how gulls communicate. And so we try to do that. And through this, we found that, um, that gulls, that actually this, the gull haters were not ubiquitous. This was a small, grumpy, noisy minority, perhaps not unlike the Tea Party. It seems like there's more of them than there are because they're so loud. And people ended up telling us very positive stories. Lots of people had raised gulls by hand. Lots of people um, had saved gulls from peril. And so we found out that actually there's a lot of folks in gull enthusiasts. And so we also produced this book, which helps you, which can introduce you into the gull language. And, and Folkestone is a bit of a hot spot for gulls. There's, there's a bit more gulls in Folkestone than a lot of other parts of Britain. So there's a, there's a field guide, it's a behavioral guide, it talks about the history of, the natural history of gulls, uh, and um, yeah, we like to advocate. All right, let me see how I'm doing time-wise. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, I wanna talk very briefly about um, what is certainly the largest work and sometimes the most known work of mine. Um, so stop me if you've heard this one before. So I'm going to talk about the, uh, the Seattle Vivarium. So uh, there was a, a period in which the, the, um, there was an area in the center of, the, of Seattle that um, was um, uh, um, where there had been petroleum transfer stations. It was, seemed to be so polluted that the developers stayed away from it. So it just ended up to be this interesting open space. The Seattle Art Museum went in. They tested it. They said, eh, it's bad, but it's not that bad. 
And so they decided to make this amazing sculpture park right in the heart of the city. They lined up their ducks in City Hall and their millionaires, and they, uh, and they started this incredibly urban-centered sculpture park. And I was invited to be one of the new commissions along with Teresita Fernandez and Louise Bourgeois. And uh, is Lisa Corrin here? Well, Lisa Corrin, who of course is, is here at the block, she was the curator of this, and I worked very closely with her. She's a marvelous curator to um, do this project, which was incredibly brave. So I had to spend a lot of time in Seattle, and Seattle kind of blew my mind. I've never been to a place with greater environmental ecological literacy than the people in Seattle. I mean, it was, it was just kind of interesting. And everyone would take me not to see, you know, the famous Calder or the other like works of public art, people would say, the first thing they would say to me, even other artists and, and curators, they would say, have you been to the fish ladder? You know, have you been to this place where you can watch the salmon swim upstream? And I thought, that's what people in Seattle are interested in, nature as process. So, and I, I spent a lot of time in the forests of Seattle as well. You know, the forests of Seattle are temperate rainforests and they are intact. You know, I grew up in New England. Those forests have been cut four or five times. It's not a forest I've stepped into that was primary in the, in the Northeast. You know, forests around Seattle can be primary and they're rainforests. And uh, because of that, that means they get over 100 inches of rain. So the, the nutrients in a forest like that would soon wash out to sea, except that those nutrients, that energy is bound into the vegetation itself. So when one of these trees falls, it begins to release that energy, and the next generation of forest grows right on top of it, right? And these are called nurse logs. I became totally interested in that. And I thought, I'm gonna take a nurse log from the forest and bring it back into the center of Seattle as a kind of ambassador for something that was there not so long ago. You know, the entire European settlement of Seattle is all done post-photography. You can really see how this city goes from very little to what it is today. And so it took about two years to find the right tree. When people think tree in Seattle, they think big, right? So we had to find a tree that we could get to. The timber companies, which are destroying these primary forests, were like, oh, we'd love to sponsor your project. Just tell us what size tree and where you want it and we'll bring it right there. And a lot of those people, of course, also sponsor the museum. So we didn't want to do a greenwashing project for them. The people at the National Forest said, We'd lo we love the project, we'd love to help you. The paperwork it would take to get a tree out of the natural forest would stretch to Washington, D.C. and back, and it would come back no. So finally, we found that there was uh, the Seattle watershed had an education mandate, and they had big trees, and they knew of a particular tree that had fallen some years before that we could get and not build a road to. So we took this tree from that forest and brought it, and here you see where the where the sculpture park is. It's right in the heart of the city. And we put it into this, what would become my purpose-built greenhouse. I hate the garbage can in this photo. It drives me nuts. Every time I look at it, I've got to get a better photo. It's like, who the hell put a garbage can in front of my fucking artwork? <laughs> so this, um, this is a purpose-built greenhouse. Every aspect of this greenhouse is about replicating the conditions that that tree came from. And you enter, oh, there it is again, okay. And you see, again, how this is right in the center of the city. You see the space needle in the back. It has this green roof because we actually worked with, with um, color engineers to, to sample what the color was under the canopy of the forest and try to replicate that um, with, the, with the light coming through this green roof. And you see, it's also built in this Bernini, this kind of exaggerated false perspective. So when you go in here, it's a little bit like Alice through the rabbit hole. It's not what you expect. And of course, you enter in through a little vestibule. There are also, as you can see, panels that try to give credit to all the people who worked with me, who helped me on this project. Um, advisors, hydrologists, scientists, people from the Park Service, curators. Uh, there is a cabinet that orients you to the piece. There's this frieze of people who have informed me about the thinking, that have informed the thinking of this piece. And then you enter in the space, and of course, it smells different. It sounds different. The quality of light is different. This is a piece that is really very sensual and affects your your um, your senses in, in every way. It harvests all the water that comes off the roof. 
it is a little bit like being in the belly of a whale. It's, it's self-regulating. So when it gets too hot, the vents open and they're loud. And when it gets too dry, the misters go on and the evaporative coolers go on and the, and the uh, fans go on. And when it gets too bright, the shades come down. So it's constantly regulating itself based on what we know about the forest where this tree came from. And then there's the tree, not like something behind glass, like a diorama, but it's really there. And it is teeming with all sorts of organisms. So most flagrantly the plants, but also um, invertebrates and, uh, and, uh, and um, lots of fungi and molds and all sorts of um, strange things. This is like it on the first day. And you see how puny those ferns are. It turns out this thing is like a spa for ferns. So these ferns grow in, you know, to four feet high very quickly. And then we have to replant them with the, uh, the pathetic ferns in the park. And so give them a little spa time as well. And then, of course, there are these tiles uh, that uh, depict some of the organisms that you will see in, on, and around the tree. But also some you won't see because we don't have woodpeckers and we don't have... Um, chipmunks, and we don't have other things that contribute to the breaking down of this. Uh, and here you see it also um, in the context of a Michael Heitzer, Roxy Payne tree behind that, um, a um, Ellsworth Kelly behind that, creepy space needle behind that. So it's, it, it really is integrated into the city in, I think, a very interesting way. And of course, we have a wonderful field guide, which tells people about some of the organisms that are depicted on the tiles and also about the names of the people on the friezes. So you learn who Ehrlich is and who, um, and who Smithson is and who Muir are. <coughs> okay, how am I doing? Uh, oh, you know what? This is a super great project. I'm not gonna talk about it because I don't have time, but it's really fun. Here's another one. This one's really great. It's in Texas, Buffalo Bayou, wonderful. I wonder if it's still there. Okay, so. Quickly, I want to talk about an, another, the last family of work I want to talk about is I, I also collaborate a lot with, inst, with museums and universities, with non-art institutions. So this is an exhibition called, uh, in Germany, called Weltwissen, World Knowledge, only in Berlin, right? And so, um, so this is a project with all of the universities in Germany that are at this point, at, they're celebrating their 300th birthday. So this is a very large, very academic, um, exhibition on the history of science, but they wanted something spectacular to introduce that. So this is kind of like the cover of a very nice book on the history of science in Berlin. So I had to go throughout the entire university and create and, and borrow things from experts to create this enormous wonder cabinet. So each one of these cubes is, is you know, six feet by six feet. So this is enormous. And you start on the left side with... Um, um, with uh, geology and cartography, going up to um, paleontology, the na all the natural sciences. In the middle you have um, the human as organism, so um, medicine and physical anthropology, humans as producers of culture, and then the abstract sciences. Uh, th but how you see the piece first is you come to it from the other side. So you see these things in silhouette, right? You see them almost as these kind of platonic ideals. So you see um, objects from the uh, ethnography collection, objects from the history of medicine collection, and then you enter, and of course the cabinet itself is torqued, so it's a hemisphere in a sense. So there are hundreds of objects, and there also are, um, there are, tel what are they called? Telescopes. Telescopes that um, have that are programmed. So when you look at particular objects, they tell you the big story of these objects. So you learn about this for the, one of the first computers, or you learn that you know this is the emperor's favorite horse, which when it died, he had the body stuffed on one side of the entrance to his castle, and he had the skeleton on the other side. This is the first iron lung. Uh, this is the speaker Hitler used for the Nuremberg rally. So obviously not all of the stories in the history of science in Berlin are going to be positive stories. Um, so this is the largest of these cabinets of curiosity. Again, you know, doing a project like this, this cabinet cost 800,000 euro to make. 
and lasted for the course of the exhibition five months and then was turned into scrap metal. To go on to a permanent piece, this is the uh, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. This is I have three minutes to do it. Uh, this is the Oceanographic Museum in Monaco. This is a marvelous museum. This is 1910, the day it opened. Obviously, in 1910, modernism is well underway, right? You don't have to build a building like this. But the first prince of Monaco, the prince, first prince Albert of Monaco, was not only the head of state. Not only did he own all the casinos. Not only did he take a piece of everything that was done in Monaco, but he was also a cetacean taxonomist, he was a whale scientist. Whenever he had free time, he would load a boat with other scientists, with oceanographers, um, uh, um, climate and, uh, and astronomical people, marine biologists, and would sail to the Arctic or the Azores. He brought all this back, eventually making what he called the temple to the ocean and science, that ocean, temple to the ocean that was the marriage of science and art. And this is it, and it's fantastic. And you know, there's no gargoyles here. It's all sea eagles and walrus and, and octopi. This is the backside. There are two floors of museum, two floors of aquarium, and seven floors of research laboratories and storage, uh, emptying at the bottom where his ship was, was um, docked, as well as the ship of his predecessor. Um, and so um, this is what the interiors look like in, uh, in 1910. This is the room of marine vertebrates. This is the room of oceanography. Everything they made, everything they made to dredge, to, uh, to look at plankton, to sail kites, to, sa to sample the atmosphere, all of it was brand new. I mean, they had to invent everything they did. So this is a room for those inventions. This is, of course, the room dear to him, the whale room. This was later taken over by one of my heroes, great filmmaker, environmentalist Jacques Cousteau. Here he is with Grace Kelly and what's his name? And, um, and Cousteau, of course, w magnificent filmmaker, great champion of conservation in the oceans, uh, great um, uh, kind of character, but perhaps not the best museum director. And so all of those wonderful spaces you saw were changed into horrible push-button didactic 1970s exhibits about how we were destroying the earth. Difficult. Um, and so, um, so the museum now thinks about itself. It continues to do conservation work, very aggressive conservation education work, and do conferences and have exhibits. But at the same time, they also see themselves as a museum of a museum, and they are slowly restoring themselves back to what they look like originally. Uh, and also, they asked me to integrate my own work into the museum, which, of course, my own work already looks like what's there. So it's very hard to tease out what is my work and what is the museum. But more importantly, this museum, like most museums, has the problem that they only show between 1% and 10% of what they actually have, which is the case of most museums. So how do we get these things out of cardboard boxes, um, these things that are, um, are doing no one any good? So they, I wanted to look at some of those images I showed you in the very beginning, the cabinet of curiosity, look backward to move forward in this museum to think about how can we get this stuff out. So my wife Dana and I spent a long time in the back rooms looking at this fantastic instrumentation, looking at the biological specimens, looking at the art that they collected and created the, oh, the last slide and I'm over. The, um, this is called the Cabinet of Oceanomania, a, a, a piece that shows the vast holdings of the collection. This side, all of the natural stuff, the bottom, the um, publications. This place, since the very beginning of its uh, existence, has been, um, has been publishing scientific uh, works. It has hundreds and hundreds of scientific works published. Here I have some of the smaller specimens that you would normally never see, things like the Bryzoa collection. Uh, here we have wet specimens from all of the different expeditions, from Cousteau's expeditions to the Amazon, to some of the Prince's expeditions, uh, some of the more spectacular things from the natural world. Um, instrumentation, art made out of ocean things. That's one of the things that they collect, art, art made out of coral, um, mother of pearl, other kinds of shells, uh, other art, um, Cousteau's model for the Calypso, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and this piece, is permanent, and that's how I want to continue to work, to make permanent things. Thank you very much.
I've been told that I can answer questions and that there are people with microphones. I can hear you. Um, so a lot of your work has elements of uh, performance and theatricality. And I was wondering how you described your relationship to performance. Uh, the question was about performance and theatricality. I mean, I, I think very much of my um, myself as a kind of character in a sense that there's very much the, um, you know, there there is, the Mark Dye and the person, and there's the Mark Dye and the art for the artist. And, and I learned a lot early on through looking at images of people like Joseph Boyce and how they use their kind of bodies as a way of intriguing and gaining a kind of attention and interest to their practice. And, and I thought that that was something I could do and, and have been very careful about the control of kind of the image of the production. But in the earliest works where I'm, I'm doing works in the... Um, especially where I'm doing works in the Amazon, and often I'm out there collecting things, I'm controlling also very much the images of what those, how those images come out and what they create. Because it's not a traditional performance audience, performer audience relationship. There is this kind of idea that someone is somewhere out there, and one has to take an element of that um, um, in faith, in a sense. So it's, I think it's a very complicated relationship to performance, but it is very consciously performance. Oh, oh hi. hi. So I was blown away by the scope of projects you're working on, and you had this statement about working until the clock ran down in London, and was wondering what strategies you've developed to limit the enormity of the subjects you work with, whether it be time, the ethics of what you're gonna present, but there's so much decision making behind the hood of your practice. What are some of the things that you've found to limit um, your scope when you're taking on so much information? Um, opening day is definitely one of them, right? <laughs> you know, that, that in some way I start there and kind of work my way back and uh, I am, I'm always, I have to say, I have this tendency to add on and to develop more and to, I'm absolutely a sort of maximalist in my approach and I'm constantly trying to um, uh, to do more in a space. And that, that, you know, if that's excessively done, it can be to the detriment of a project, right? But I, I do try to um, kind of keep a focus and all of these projects are, also collaborations with institutions and curators. And I, I think that, um, you know, there's a generation of artists that I learned from who for them, the curator was in some way an antagonist, right? And I feel like the people I work with are very much collaborators and very much we are on the same team. You know, I work very closely with them and listen very carefully to their advice as professionals and, uh, you know, identify with um, with their goal, which is also to make an amazing project. So, so I do also have one of the strategies is to be open and listen and be respectful of the professionals that I, I work with in, in terms of, you know, I also, a lot of the projects like Oceanomania, it, for instance, this is a collaboration with um, not this cabinet, but the exhibition itself was a collaboration with Serena Basta, who is a curator I work with very often, and we do extremely challenging, elaborate, very maximal um, curatorial projects. And she likes to pull back and I like to add on and we have a, somehow a, a beautiful relationship that way. Hi. I see you, okay. <laughs> cool. Um, have you ever done any sort of piece in this curiosity cabinet style that was like a, in a 360 view so that like you look at one side and then you turn to the next side and then you're like really overstimulated and you keep spinning around? Hmm. I mean, I have done projects where you, you kind of walk 
in, in some way, where you walk through, I mean, often the exhibitions that Serena and I do, um, I, and even the, the exhibition that's at the ICA Boston right now, ha they have a very strong kind of narrative. So they are immersive, but not immersive in that they are this kind of surround, um, um, this kind of surrounding element. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you first for all I learned in such a short time tonight. But I'd also like to uh, tell you that I've actually worked as a best boy. Oh, okay. What is that? Well, a best boy is uh, one of the, essentially a stagehand on a movie set. And the best boy, no matter what uh, its gender identity or their gender identity might be, uh, helps the gaffer and the grip. They're the next one in line. They're like okay. the assistant gaffer and grip. Now, I won't tell you what a gaffer and a grip do, though. You have to, you'll have to come back and show us the rest of the slides. All right. And then good. I'll come back and tell you what a gaffer does. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, I guess I'm curious about how you feel the romantize, romanticization of these like lost and found natural objects, if there's any examples of the effects that's had on you or um, the viewer as far as you know, environmental action? Uh-huh. Well, I, you know, I mean, I try, I am, there are two things that I think are touchstones that I, I'm always very carefully trying to avoid. One, one is nostalgia, you know, which for me is, even though my work has a lot of sometimes evokes a kind of historical place. I'm trying never to present that as though that were a better time. You know, for me, like, nostalgia means always golden aging, right? Saying that there was this moment in the past that somehow was better, and I just, I mean, I just don't believe that, right? And romanticism is kind of tricky because I have a relationship to historic romanticism that maybe I identify a little bit with, say, if we're talking about you know, the uh, romantic movement in Europe or the, or the romantic painting tradition or transcendentalism in the United States. Um, so that's something it's a, I'm kind of tricky, I'm a little worried, concerned about the pitfalls of romanticism. At the same time, I identify with some of the aspects of romanticism, which is, you know, the kind of notion of the sublime, the notion of finding within nature something larger than ourselves, but I'm not connecting that to a, a kind of spiritual place. For me, kind of nature and dealing with nature in a scientific way is, is kind of enough. You know, I don't really need to have a spiritual relationship with those things. But I am very much um, moved very often when I work with um, objects that are museum objects, and I'm very cautious also of the kinds of museum objects I work with and what they may mean to other people. So, you know, I mean, I see this work as, um, uh, you know, as, as um, very much kind of post-colonial interrogation, but it's a very complex one, right? Hi, thank you very much. Um, Two-part question revolving around movies. Was this was the naturalist character, the archaeologist character that you re kind of referred to in the first question? Was the, was the inspiration for that? Did it come from any kind of fictional or cinematic experience you had when you were younger? I know I've always been intrigued by archaeology because of the mummy movies and right. the archaeologist and the daughter and the assistant and that, that triage. And also my second question, especially based on this slide, is how close are you with Wes Anderson? <laughs> you guys are so similar. People always ask me that. I'm, I'm doing a project now following the footsteps of some people who um, early on went to Texas and I'm very interested in seeing if I could show up at his place and see if we could have a conversation. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think that when, when I'm doing projects like the archaeologist, I'm not an archaeologist, and, and I know enough archaeologists uh, to know that clearly there's a very little relationship between what I do 
and what an actual archaeologist of today does. At the same time, I think what I do very often looks more like archaeology for most people than what they actually do, which I think is very funny. And, and certainly there are um, models that I'm inspired by, and that can be everything from, yeah, from Tintin to Hammer Horror Films. And, and I, I, I'm playing very much uh, with those tropes, but also even when I'm speaking of scientists, I'm also speaking of scientists who are people who are maybe the more, the, the people in that world who are more transitional, who are somewhere, so are people like Rachel Carson, people like Stephen Gould, who really put the energy into um, communicating their complex fields and ideas to a broader public. I'm very interested in that. I'm, not, I'm really not interested in scientists who just talk to scientists in the same way I'm not interested in artists who just talk to artists, right? Um, so I had a question dealing with like where you see the line of where you're cooperating or if you're challenging um, kind of like museum standards. So you, I see it as like you've criticized a lot of uh, or like modernized quote unquote the like dioramas, um, especially within New York. Um, so we, would you be able to speak about that? Um, where the differences between kind of criticizing the museum practices, and also you have to cooperate with it because you're dealing with a lot of their collection, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's, it's really easy to see the museum as the kind of unified and perhaps oppressive institution from the outside, but behind the scenes, museums are like, they are battlegrounds of ideas, and they're not at all unified, and there's a lot of people behind the scenes fighting for the meaning of museums, and a lot of people are coming from a quite critical tradition. You know, there are a lot of people, when I started working, getting access to back rooms at museums and exhibition places, I found that, oh, yeah, they're fluent in Michel Foucault as well, and they're fluent in, uh, uh, you know, and they know Walter Benjamin back and forth, and they've read the same books and come from the same places. Not everyone in the museum is like that, of course. So, so they are, there's also pushback from a more conservative side. and. I'm really interested in that, and I'm interested in seeing how and why museums use artists. And often, you know, in the very beginning when I started working with museums, um, there was, it was tremendously difficult to insert yourself in. And that dramatically changed after Fred Wilson's exhibition, Mining the Museum, where he really taught the museum what is the benefit of having an artist um, look at the museum and work with the museum, largely because he just made their museum a way better museum, right? And that that's a really interesting way. I think there are, you know, in this kind of model of institutional critique, there's kind of two camps, right? There are people who think that the museum is the site of the ideology of the ruling class and it can never be fixed and you might as well just blow it up, right? And then there are people I would say like Fred Wilson and David Wilson and Rosamund Purcell and, and myself who just who somehow identify with the core museum element, which is that there's a possibility, you know, this kind of enlightenment project that, that one can learn through an encounter with things, right? So it, my critique and my, um, and my tweaking and my antagonism all comes from a place of identification in some way. I don't want to blow up the museum. I want to make a better, more responsible, more intelligent, more democratic, more fun, more inclusive museum. Hey. Oh, it's not me? I don't know. You go ahead. Uh, I was going to ask. Um, uh, hi. Um, hi. So your work has uh, an underlying theme of like giving back to both humanity and nature um, by utilizing what's already presented within nature. Um, and I think that in the current state of uh, the globe, 
what ha would you consider your footprint on this planet to be greater or lesser than like that of somebody next to you just um, due to your work in preserving for humans nature oh, i don't i think i have a pretty big footprint you know i mean i i really don't present i don't want to in any way present myself as a kind of ecological saint i am 100% not that you know and and i i feel very implicated by the very things that are destroying the world, I think, as, as many people are. And, uh, you know, I, I think I can't really speak from a position outside of that. And that's kind of not really who I am. But I think also part of that is that, I mean, my interrogation is a kind of way of trying to figure out how we get to this place where we have this kind of suicidal relationship to the natural world. And I, I think that that is encoded in the history of ideas, and I think also some of those ideas are encoded in the history of objects, right? And so it's a, it's a bit of a, I don't know, it's a kind of, you know, people always talk about the art and science thing. I think for me, it's really the art and history of science thing, and that, that's kind of where I'm looking. And I, I think if the goal in some way is to be part of the, um, something that is a progressive culture of nature, I think you need people from all different places and I think you know there are a lot of artists who are working with scientists and engineers and landscape people to find solutions and and that's work I love but that's absolutely not who I am and there are artists who spend time representing nature as beauty in some way to elicit um, love and identification and empathy and I appreciate that too but that's not who I am I'm I'm you know a guy kind of looking at the history of ideas about nature, in a, in a sense. We have time for one more question. Claire, it has to be you. That you would be me. Hi. Um, is this on? Oh. Mark, that was prodigious. A really uh, beautiful um, array of thoughts and objects. Um, I'm thinking about uh, well, a group of us are thinking about what would be a kind of exhibition for the Anthropocene. And um, I've noticed that a lot of artists have been making cabinets of curiosity um, with objects that are kind of combinations of natural and artificial. And looking at this kind of review of your work, I remember how you, you used to have this lecture where you talked about the Museum of Natural History and the Met. Uh -huh. the yeah. two sides of the Central Park. And your work has always been combining, like looking at nature through a lens of the human interaction with it. It seems like, you know, it's like yeah. always there's a, there's a field that way. And, um, but you don't use the term Anthropocene. Um, maybe it's not useful to you. Um, but I wonder if you could maybe comment on this that you've always had this perspective that combined the natural and the human intervention in the natural. Yeah, I, you know, I think part of that comes from, you know, in, in some, I, I don't want to bring it all down to this kind of corny thing, but, but where I grew up, you know, that I grew up in, uh, in New England and, uh, and I, you know, I'm from a, a, a kind of small town next to a very gritty industrial city but in, you know, in 20 minutes on a bicycle, you could be in farmland. And 20 minutes the other way, you could be in a forest, or you could be on coastal marshes, or you could be in really crazy polluted waterways. And so I never had an experience that, I never had an idea that nature was something pristine, that it had to be, I never associated nature with wilderness, in a sense, but that maybe if I had grown up out west, I would. That, there were, that nature and culture, we're always side by side and always ever present in, in each other's construction. And I think that that's, uh, you know, that kind of lack of a notion of, of uh, the pristine has always been a, an important part of my conceptualization of, of what that, what wilderness means in a sense, so, or what nature means in a sense, so that, and, and what culture means as well, that these things have never been, um, have never been apart and have never been um, pure in the same way that, you know, my first museum that I went to as a child is the Whaling Museum in New Bedford, right? It's a museum that is a museum of natural history 
and a museum of cultural history, and the museum of industry, and a museum of art, kind of all mashed up together, which always felt like a normal way for a museum to be. And then I, I went to other places and found that the museums were kind of segregated in categories that did not seem to make sense in a way, or there was no real reason to do that. And so anyway, I think a lot of it, that's where it comes from. I realized that I didn't talk about Mildred's Lane, and I really wanted to, uh, but I h highly encourage you all to look up Mildred's Lane and to, and if these ideas and the kind of things that are happening here are interesting to you, maybe becoming a resident fellow at Mildred's Lane is something you'd be interested in. And uh, so I encourage you to do that on your own. All right, thanks everyone.